Thank you, Chairpersons, and uh, thank doc my teacher, Dr. Philip Augustine and Dr. Roy Mukada for having given me this opportunity to speak on this podium. And my topic is, what is the recent advances in the management of portal hypertensive bleed? Introducing the topic, gastroesophageal varicell hemorrhage is a life-threatening complication. And historically, the mortality was reported up to 30 to 50 percent, and one year of mortality was up to 70 percent. And this was the era of you know, between 1970 to 1990, when therapies to reduce portal hypertension and with the improved recitation techniques and antibiotics have really improved the outcomes of this particular devastating complication. So we had novel endoscopic and radiology therapies which have improved outcomes. Endoscopic spleotherapy, which was initially introduced way back in 1980s or late 70s, has largely been superseded by endoscopic varicell ligation. The first ligation was done by Von Stigman. And after 1990 or between 2000, we started seeing more incidents of gastric vessel bleeding, which has been managed with tissue adhesives like cyanocrylate and thrombin. So with this present recitative techniques, outcomes with endoscopic and radiological improvement. The mortality is now being reported somewhere between 6 to 12 percent in any of these uh, variceal bleeds. Any variceal bleed, why is it we had to go ahead and do some more, introduce more techniques to bring the outcome because it depends on the clinical variable of outcomes in variceal hemorrhage and we have two predictable mort uh, Predictors. One is a day five treatment failure and a day a six week treatment failure when we found that patients with child C requiring more transfusions, presence of portal vein thrombosis had a much higher five day treatment failure than compared to others. Same way when a patient with a lesser albumin, increasing bilirubin, requiring transfusional total, going into encephalopathy had much poorer outcomes than patients who had not these things. So it necessitated that we need to improve our outcomes by advancing the techniques and, and have a concomitant uh, different management strategies. Uh, briefly dwelling on the history of this, pre-1970s it was SB tube and in 70 to 80 the rigid endoscope was replaced by fiber optic scope and sclerotherapy was introduced. In 1988 the first EVBL with elastic O-rings was, was used when EVB and endoscopic valves became the norm. And there were some comparison studies between EST and transection surgeries in 1988 where found uh, transection surgeries had a slightly better uh, uh, outcomes but mortality was not uh, really different. Um, this is followed by in 1990s where endoscopic varicose regulation and glue injections were standardized for gastric viruses. And these treatments were optimized by introduction of pharmacological therapies. We had introduction of octreotide, somatostatin, and telepresin. And introduction of telepresin has shown that the mortality, overall mortality in these bleeds have really come down. But the real improvement in these outcomes happened between 2000 2010 when the role of antibiotics was, uh, was uh, uh, indicated that, that Patients who received antibiotics had a better outcome with lesser mortality, lesser reblade, and control of infection. There were three papers regarding this. And in 2003, Andrew K. Burroughs gave it his editorial that role of antibiotics. Antibiotics are key in, in preventing the six-week mortality or a five-day treatment failure. The second thing you said, how do we optimally transfuse blood? And this paper, which came from Madrid, Will Evan News said that if you have a restrictive transfusion strategy, that means if you can... If you can transfuse only the hemoglobin is less than 7 grams and not keep it at 9 grams, patients had a better outcome instead of having over transfusing these patients. Then again, the, we started noticing there is increased bleed due to gastric viruses which accounted to 10 to 30 percent of these bleeds. And there then the standardizer of glue and thrombin as hemostatic agents were, were, were considered. And we achieved an immediate hemostasis with glue or thrombin to 92 to 100 percent. But the bovine thrombin had to, be, uh, to be, had to be withdrawn mainly because there was this transmission prion and now we have some human thrombin which studies are going on and which has accounted for uh, much better success in patients with gastric varices. Uh, again, 
in somewhere in the late 90s or 2010, there was this description of this emerging role of trans intrahepatic uh, portosystemic shunts. This was a one which uh, improved the outcome of the bleed. The rebleed rates were much lesser, and the six-week mortality and the much, much and one-year mortality came down with the introduction of tips. But the problem we had was during the early teams of tips, the tips was done with uh, non-covered uh, graphs, and there was a high occlusion of rates which led to more problems later. But somewhere between 2004, the advent of covered stents, uh, you were being used in TIPS, and that showed a better outcome uh, in patients used at TIPS in, in, in respect to a treatment failure or mortality. One singular study which came from, which came from Barcelona group showed immediately after a bleed or when we have optimize the therapy with a vasopressor or an endoscopic therapy, if we are able to reduce the HVPG to less than 16, the re-bleed rates were high. Then the concept of this came, should we do a early TIPS or TIPS should be done as a rescue therapy is something which was uh, taken up and there were three studies, one from Barcelona and two from another two multi-center European trials said that Doing an early TIPS was much better, had a much better outcome than using TIPS as a rescue therapy. That means if the bleeding has failed, your endoscopic treatment has failed, uh, and then use a TIPS as a rescue therapy, it did not show much uh, early TIPS. But means once you stabilize the patient on the third or fifth day, if you could do TIPS, it showed a much better outcome. So this was uh, reported. Uh, this was reported and early tips is now being recommended in Bavino 5 guidelines that we could consider using early tips in management of these bleeds, uh, in these bleeds in patients who have undergone a varicell val bleed. Uh, for the gastric bleed, then we had interventional radiological uh, procedures like uh, balloon retroglide transgastric obliteration, especially when a patient had a bleeding gastric varices and if a patient had an, an an open or a, a spleno-renal shunt, this could be occluded by using a balloon catheter and BRTO has been successfully used in patients with a large gastric varicell bleeds, especially when the patients were not very, very, they uh, uh, are not compatible to tips at that point of time. So this has been used and many a time the gastric varicell bleeds have come down. So two important uh, changes which have happened between the two is is the, on, is the use of tips with a covered stent which increase the patency of the graft, graft and recommendation that tips can be used as an early tips procedure rather than a rescue therapy which has now been got into the guideline, Bavino 5 guidelines and BR2 was used for massive gastric varicell bleeds especially when the spleno-renal shunts are really open in these patients. So post-2010 use of early tips has been established there were 63 patients with cirrhosis, which is a European multicenter trial with bleeding varibus, received to receive early tips and vasoactive drugs. Patients with early tips had lower rebleed rates and had a higher survival rate at one year. So Baveno has in incorporated these guidelines for an early tips approach in this pa these patients. Uh, another use has been the use of self-expanding esophageal stents in patients who had a refractory bleed, especially for esophageal varices. The first trial came from Europe, 20 patients where 100% hemostasis were achieved, but 25% of these stents showed a migration in initial study, and when the, when the stents migrated, 10% of deaths were seen when migration was occurred. Subsequently, there were three studies from Europe which showed 57 patients successful, hemostasis were 100%, but 18% had migration. So the present recommendation is, if the patient is, when we use stents for these patients, Possibly, we can use a stent for an immediate hemostasis and bridge him to a other, surgery, other procedure like a TIPS procedure. Two studies, one from Barcelona, another study from UK, are now comparing esophageal stents with standard enthoscurity and stents have no role in gastric variceal bleeding. This is the Elidana stents which has been kept. Generally, we keep it and after four to five days, we plan to remove it, but there has been incidence of bleeding once you remove it. The another new area of interest which has been developed under the hemostatic powders or spray 
This is called a TC325. It's a granular, non-absorbable mineral powder used in management of arterial bleeds. It achieves hemostasis by active, activating platelets or increasing concentration of clotting factors. It is now comes from the Cook Company. There is no proteins from animals or humans. There is a pilot study by Ibrahim. This requires a, it requires by using a spray catheter through the endoscope. There was study of 21 patients, 21 grams of powder sprayed by spray catheter, no rebleed within 24 hours. It has also been now used along with uh, radio frequency ablation in patients with gastric antral vascular ectasia. All the patients had reduced transpiration requirement. One patient had perforation, but it was not known whether this was this is because of the powder, or is it because of uh, is it because of an endoscopy? And a one month mortality has not been reported of this procedure. It has not still come to the market, but it has been now been validated in the population by Cook. Um, so what is the other exciting, excited uh, frontiers which has happened in the endovascular therapy is the ultrasound guided intravascular therapy. Uh, now we have started using endoscopic uh, US guided obliteration to look, uh, US endoscopic ultrasound to look for obliteration of perforator vessels. After sclerotherapy they have started now using because the rebleeds are high mainly because if the perforator vessels are obliterated. So Bin Muller group started using the patency of of the perforator vessels and started injecting into this. So they did a study of 27 patients where patients who have failed initial uh, EVBL or EST and they found when the, perf the US guided injection of sclerosal perforator vessels brought down the bleeding and it required less than 2.2 sessions to obliterate the valises. When Di Polo compared in from Brazil compared 50 patients treated with US gu guided sclerotherapy with standard sclerotherapy, lesser number of rebreeds with US guided treatment. Currently, the US guided perforator therapy is reserved only for bleeding refractory to band ligation, band ligation and conventional therapy. I think the best use of US guided intravascular therapy has come with gastric varicel bleeding. And if you look at the role of US, endoscopic ultrasound can really pick up fundal varices six times more than a conventional endoscopy. It can monitor, once we have injected, it can also monitor the endoscopic ultrasound by ultrasound the obliteration of the flow or through the Doppler. The second important thing is you don't, foot or any liquid does not interfere with US, uh, um, uh, with the endoscopic ultrasound pictures or your monitoring. Residual presence of viruses by US after obliteration of, by a glue injection will suggest higher bleeding rate. So we can use endoscopic ultrasound to obliterate by uh, operated those residual viruses and confirmed by usual Doppler. And the second thing we do after obliteration, endoscopic ultrasound has been used to target the feeder vessels, which can be done with cyanoacrylate and lipidol. And it has been found that if you concomitantly obliterate both the fundal viruses and the feeder vessels, it requires lesser amount of uh, cyanoacrylate and it refers number of lesser number of session, session uh, or level lesser number of sessions to obliterate the viruses. The other exciting thing is uh, endoscopic ultrasound guide coiling can be done especially can be used for gastric and ectopic viruses. These are the nickel alloy uh, coils which can be easily entered into, into a 19 gauge needle and we can use coil embolization of the gastric ulcer uh, of uh, fundal viruses or uh, ectopic viruses. Occasionally we can use both fundal varicel glue injection and coiling. We can use coil and then followed by a glue injection. It is said the coils will hold as a scaffolding for the glue injection. This is a patient which we had a large diotal varix. Uh, this is a, a la who was bleeding. His endoscopic, uh, his both his uh, fundal varices and varicel were obliterated. You can see the needle coming into a large diotal varix and we embolized him with coil, two coils can be seen placed inside the varix followed by a glue injection. And following that you can see that particular area the Doppler has been, uh, Doppler shows complete obliteration of a complete absence of flow. And uh, since the duodal varix was big, two more coils were placed and complete obliteration of duodal varix was done. <coughs> 
patient had stopped re-bleeding and he was bleeding from the, uh, you can see that whole area that there was a complete uh, obliteration. And followed this by a CT shows uh, good coils which are placed in the duodenal varix which has completely obliterated the varix. This is again a feeder vessel being obliterated uh, by uh, endoscopic varicell ligation in a fundal varix. This is a diagrammatic picture, it's a large fundal varix where it shows both coil and obliteration has been done with the coil and sinoacrylate and after six weeks you can see a complete obliteration of the, uh, of the uh, castic varix. What are the other uses? We can use endoscopic ultrasound guided uh, therapy, portal vein angiography and pressure measurements has been getting done. There is a group in Barcelona which that way in their portal hemodynamic, once uh, an endoscopic uh, obliteration has been done, they use endoscopic ultrasound to measure the portal vein and if the portal vein pressures are very high, they immediately take up this patient for tips to prevent further re-bleeding. Now, Bin Molar has now described in anal models uh, endoscopic guided transgastric transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunk. They puncture the portal vein through the transgastric, go through that and they can also get into the hepatic vein and put a stent. This has been done in animal models and this is done by a lumen opposing transgastric axon stent. They call this axon stent and you can see this is what they have done from the IVC to the portal vein to the hepatic vein and they have seen that the stents can be sacrificed, the animals are sacrificed and stents are in position and this has been done entirely by an endoscopic ultrasound. Uh, the other thing we could do by an endoscopy is a microcoil selective embolization of the branch of portal vein for selective hypertrophy before any of the liver for any hepatic, like portal vein embolization what we do preoperatively now has been done endoscopy by endoscopic ultrasound using a microcoil embolization. So the development of endoscopic access and therapies has transformed management of variceal hemorrhage. Failure of EVBL or EST can be tackled by early tips and BRTO. I think advent of interventional EUS has enabled access to deeper gastric viruses and coil embolization. US guided tips is a promising development for future therapy. The new developments have optimized managements in combination with pharmacotherapy, antibiotics and conventional endoscopy to reduce the mortality. The need for shunt surgery has been obviated by recent advances in management. Thank you for hearing.